thirty years, many developments have taken place since the pioneering days of railway preservation in the early sixties. We travel first to Wales to visit in turn the Vale of Rydal, the Tullathlin, the Welsh Bull and Flan Fair, and finally the Festiniog Railway. But first the Vale of Rydal, which in the late 1950s and early 60s was enjoying somewhat of a resurgence following a decision by British Railways to promote this most attractive narrow-gauge line. We start at the Vale of Rydal locomotive shed at Aberystwyth, now sadly but a memory. The depot was later abandoned. Emerging from the shed is number nine, one of the three locomotives working this one foot eleven and a half inch gauge line. Number nine started life as number two, built in 1902 by Davies and Metcalf for the opening of the line. Renumbered as 1213 when the Great Western took control of the line in 1923, the locomotive was later rebuilt by the Western Region of British Railways in 1956, regaining both her original number and name, the Prince of Wales. Ivo next visited Aberfroyd, a name meaning the mouth of the river. By the 1950s, this was the main intermediate station between Aberystwyth and the terminus of the line at Devil's Bridge. Number 9 runs in with the afternoon train from Aberystwyth and draws up adjacent to the lineside column, where water will be taken. Ivo's visit was made on the 3rd of June 1963, before the start of the summer season. Note that the signal arms are not yet in place, having been removed and taken into storage at the end of the previous summer. The Prince of Wales pulls away from this most attractive location. And now you can see, in addition to the fully lined Great Western livery, as applied to the Vale of Rydal locomotives in 1957, the coaching stock had been repainted chocolate and cream. After visiting Aberfroyd, Ivo decided to drive nearer to the terminus at Devil's Bridge in order to film the return run. So here we see number nine, now running bunker first, emerging from a steep rock cutting to drift around the reverse curves on the run back towards Aberystwyth. We turn now to the pioneer of the preservation movement, the Tullathlin Railway, which when visited by Ivo at the end of September 1961, had already witnessed a decade of working under the banner of a preserved or restored railway. A touch of deception. This pub sign was located many a mile from the line, in fact near Malvern. And now to the Tullathlin proper where we will first visit the Narrow Gauge Railway Museum at Town Wharf to see Russell on static display from the North Wales Narrow Gauge Railway. Russell was purchased for preservation and moved to town in 1955. Ten years later, the locomotive was transferred back to the Welsh Highland Railway at Port Maddock for restoration to working order, where she can be seen today. Inside the museum, we see Dot, an 1887 built 18 inch gauge Bayer Peacock 040 and to the left, George Henry, a one foot, eleven and a half inch gauge A4O tank, built in 1877 by de Winton. Outside, we find a French locomotive, Combray, which displayed a feature which intrigued Ivo, outside valve gear. Combray had worked on meter gauge ironstone lines and was built in 1888 by Verve Corbet et of Paris. Now we've moved on to Bryn Glass, meaning Green Hill. We're about midway along the line, and in time to see number one, Tullathlin, heading home towards Tawin. Yep. Next at Dol 
Bourgogne, where all trains running inland pause to take on water. This is number six Douglas, built by Andrew Barclay in 1918, running in and drawing to a halt amongst the rhododendron bushes which abound in this beautiful area. Pulling away from Dolgoch, this low-level shot is what Ivo would refer to as a worm's eye view. A well patronized train heading for Abergenolwyn. Returning now to Bryn Glass, and Douglas pauses before setting off again towards town and passing Talaflin waiting in the loop with an up train. Norman Lockett photographs the exchange of the single line tokens. With the single line ahead now clear, Talaflin pulls forward across the ungated crossing to call at the station before heading onwards inland. This superb example of the restoration skills provided by volunteers was appreciated by Ivo, an old coach from the former Corus Railway. Back at Tauen, Douglas rests the end of another run. Ivo also captured this conversation piece, featuring the late Sir Thomas Salt on the left, enjoying the delights of the Talaflin Railway with Patrick Whitehouse. Two years later, in 1963, Ivo returned to the Talaflin, first visiting the yard at Pendro, where Douglas is seen. Here, Douglas pulls out number four, Edward Thomas. Douglas was built at the Kilmarnock works of Andrew Barclay and Co. in 1918. The locomotive was presented to the Talafin Railway Society in 1953. After an extensive overhaul, which included re-gauging the locomotive from two feet to two feet three inch gauge, the 040 well tank commenced service on the line in 1954. Number four, Edward Thomas, was a product from the works of Kerr Stewart and Co of Stoke-on-Trent and dates from 1921. She had been rebuilt by Hunslet during 1951-52. As seen here, number four had been fitted with a Giesel ejector, another first for the Talith Lim, preempting trials made by BR with somewhat more modern steam motive power. Another of the railway's locomotives, and perhaps the most famous, number one, Talith Lim herself. An 040 saddle tank built in 1865 by Fletcher Jennings and Company of Whitehaven, Talithlin was delivered new for the opening of the Talithlin Railway. When the Preservation Society took over the line in 1951, number one had lain out of use for several years, but was later rebuilt and superbly restored to the condition seen here. Setting off from Tauen Wharf Station, Douglas heads a train for Abiginolwyn under the Abadabi Road. Later in the day, this train nearly caught Ivo out. He wasn't expecting to see a double header, but he gave chase in order to film the train again running into Dolgoch. time on her own, Douglas is seen running through the woods, heading towards Abiginolwyn.
where we have our final view of the line, with the little locomotive drawing forward at the end of another run. Another famous line is the Welsh Bull and Llan Fair, two feet six inch gauge. This had ceased to carry passengers eight years after the Cambrian Railway had been absorbed by the GWR. It survived as a freight only line until closure by British Railways in November 1956. Here are two Earls together, the late Earl of Norfolk standing beside number one, the Earl. One of the two original Welsh Bull and Clanfair locomotives, which following closure of the line had been placed in store by VR. Encouraged perhaps by the efforts of the Talathlin and Festiniog Railway Societies, a preservation movement was formed to save the Welsh Bull and Clan Fair. After surmounting many legal difficulties, which included the need to form a limited company, the volunteers succeeded in obtaining a lease of the line from the British Transport Commission. Having been overhauled by BR at Oswestry Works, the Earl returned to his old haunts on the 28th of July 1961, and is seen here later the same summer at Clan Fair undertaking some shunting duties. Later the same day, Ivo filmed the ensemble arriving at Castle Carinion. In a scene that epitomizes the train in the countryside, number one sets off along the line east of Castle Carinion, the engine whistle causing what Ivo referred to as a little consternation to the local cattle before crossing a narrow lane on the level. At the time, this section of the line had yet to be reopened to traffic, this being a run made especially for Ivo. So, if the local farmer's milk yield was down that day, Ivo considered that indirectly, he may have been to blame. Later in the day, the Earl set off cautiously, heading back towards Flan Fair. Does anyone know who the gentleman is riding shotgun? The same train is seen running beside the River Bunwe. Now, a brief shot from the train. Brief because despite Ivo making use of his special camera clamp, the conditions of some of the track was to defeat his efforts. Here we arrive back at Clan Fair at the conclusion of a successful trip. By the time Ivo next visited the Welsh Bull and Clan Fair, the line had been reopened to traffic between Clan Fair and Castle Carinion. This sequence, however, shows a rather sad event. The very last train to run out of Welsh Pool prior to total closure of the section of line as far as the outskirts of the town at Raven Square. The Earl, having set back into Welshpool, is seen coming out towards Raven Square and approaching the road crossing. At the roundabout, there was considerable road traffic. Well, considerable for the early 1960s. 
and the train was halted to enable the flagman to clear the road. Then the train, having got the right of way, pulls across the road. The driver of the Vauxhall appears to be about to risk life and limb, but wisely decides to stop and give way to the Earl. Here the little locomotive is climbing Golper Bank in fine style. The one in 30 gradient was the steepest on the entire system of the former Cambrian railways. <laughs> Nearing the top of the bank, number one is still making good progress but not so rapid as to prevent Ivo and his Bentley leapfrogging ahead for this shot of the train approaching Castle Carinion. As the train sets off over the crossing immediately east of Castle Carinion station, the photographers are already making a dash to their cars to give chase for the remainder of the journey on towards Cranfair. Now the Welsh Bull of Humphrey's other engine, number two, the Countess, which had returned to the line on October the 6th, 1962, following purchase from British Railways. After a thorough overhaul, which included a repaint in Cambrian Railways livery, the Countess is seen setting off from Castle Corinian. The Countess is viewed further up the line, crossing the River Bunwy on the run towards Funfair. In the evening, Ivo filmed the O6Os together. Both were built for the Welsh Bull and Clanfair Light Railway in 1902 by Bayer Peacock and delivered for the opening of the line in 1903. The locomotives were named in honour of the Earl and Countess of Powys, who had owned some of the land purchased for the railway. Identical in design, these twins shared traffic duties over the line for the entire 53 years from opening to closure by BR. In 1923, when ownership of the line had passed to the GWR, the locomotives were renumbered 822 and 823, and a few years later, both were westernized to the condition seen here.
This final view of the line is perhaps a good example of Ivo's ability to spot an attractive setting for filming. A beautiful scene as the Earl heads east alongside the river. No trip by Ivo to film the narrow gauge lines in Wales was ever considered complete without a visit to the Festiniog. And so it was in 1963, but on this occasion the itinerary allowed only the briefest of glimpses of the line. So with NHY 581 parked under the shade of a laburnum tree, Norman Lockett is coaxed out for a filming and photography session at Tanny Book. To be rewarded with this view of one of the famous double fairies threading through the woods near the station. Later, another shot of the train dropping down the grade, heading away from Tannibal towards Port Manic. In 1963, an entirely new narrow gauge railway opened, but far removed from Wales at Bicton Gardens near East Budley and South East Devon. This 18 inch gauge line opened on the 6th of April 1963. Ivo visited Bicton in late September the same year and immediately became enchanted by the delightful setting. Mm. Motive power for the new line was this oil-fired 040 tank built in 1916 by the Avonside Engine Company for the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich where it remained in use until 1959. The name Woolwich is still carried, following an overhaul in 1962 and repainting in the royal blue and yellow lined livery adopted by the Bicton Woodland Railway. The motive power facilities are adjacent to the station, the starting point for our trip. Set off from the station, although not seen in these shots, the line passes the ice house, a reminder of the era long before the invention of the household refrigerator, before skirting a lake and passing to the Pintum on the approach to Pine Junction.
By the way, the ex-London and South Western Railway signals previously saw duty at Limston on the Exmouth branch, just a short distance from the line. Junction, the second station on the system, the line divides to form a long return loop around the woodland gardens. The guard who's reset the points ready for the return journey makes haste to rejoin the train. The short siding had just been laid to enable a refreshment coach to be stabled during the peak holiday season. Return journey, the train runs beside the lake and heads back towards the terminus, a round trip just 80 yards short of a mile. travel overseas, but only as far as the lovely Isle of Man, whose narrow-gate railway system was to become a favourite of Ivo's. First, however, a visit to the little Gravel Glen Railway, located to the east of Onshan, north of Douglas. This is Polar Bear, a two-foot gauge, two four oh side tank, displaying what Ivo referred to as a fairground livery, and perhaps, at the time of his visit, not in the best of mechanical condition. As he was to witness here, near the end of the three-quarter mile run, where there's a rather steep climb set on a sharp curve in the line. By this stage, the crew were showing signs of concern, thinking that the pony truck may have parted company with the rails. But no, all the wheels were still where they should be. So with the crew having gone off to have a little think, Norman Lockett gives Polar Bear the once-over. By now, the little 240 was running dangerously low on water, so with the carriages uncoupled, the engine was able to make the grade on her own. Just. Water is taken, shades of the Titfield Thunderbolt here, as first Polar Bear is replenished by the bucketful, and then with the aid of some old milk churns. side tank refilled, all is now well again. The little locomotive sets back down the grade to be reunited with her two carriages and some very patient passengers. The Gradle Glen still operates today and we hasten to add that not only is the motive power in excellent mechanical condition but also sports a proper green livery. Well worth a visit. Now we transfer attention to the island's main line railway system. In the early 1960s, still under the management of the redoubtable Mr. Sherd, a strict disciplinarian who didn't welcome the close attention of photographers to his railway. At least, that was his attitude until 1961, when Ivo first visited the line. After some initial adverse reaction to Ivo's request to film the railway, Mr. Sherd was won over by Ivo's charming personality not to mention a glass of light ale. As Ivo later recalled, Mr. Sherd's change of heart was to lead to some of the happiest and most successful narrow-gauge filming sessions I ever had. We can now enjoy the results of those happy sessions, which provide a unique archive record of the Isle of Man Railway. What we will see is, in effect, a montage of a working day on the railway, featuring both the southern line from Douglas heading towards Port Erin followed by a look at the northern line to St John's, where the route divided to serve Peel and Ramsey. First, however, an example of the Isle of Man's motive power. 
all bar one solitary locomotive were the work of Bayer Peacock, charming two four O's and very elderly. This is number five, Mona, built in 1874. Douglas, the headquarters of the Isle of Man system, and a feature which appealed to Ivo, those imposing bracket signals guarding access to the station. The bracket signals are seen here in the background as another of the Bayer Peacock 240s runs in. This is a train from Peel. Over at the locomotive yard, we view the activities preparing for the start of a day's work. This is number 11, Maitland, built in 1905. Coaling up was done the hard way, by hand, using small baskets. Then opening up the front end to rod through and clear the boiler tubes. Ivo found all this early morning activity fascinating. It's now about 8 o'clock and the locomotives are being prepared for service, not forgetting that all-important task of oiling up. As was inevitably the case, the locomotive's paint and brasswork were maintained in immaculate condition. It was virtually unknown to see an unkempt locomotive. No doubt Mr. Sheard saw to that. Next we see the crews taking to their respective locomotives, which are then marshalled into their correct running order. Locomotives would then get their stock together. In this busy scene, number 12 Hutchins, dating from 1908, is pulling out stock from the carriage sidings on the opposite side of the line to the motive power depot, whilst two other locomotives are seen in the station. Hutchinson again collecting yet another coach to add to her train. On the left, Norman Lockett, who accompanied Ivo on his 1961 visit to the Isle of Man, is talking to Mr. Bond, head of the Isle of Man Tourist Board. Hutchinson sets off for Port Erin. This was a very heavy train, which together with the steep climb out of Douglas, required the assistance of a banker. Climbing away from Douglas, this is number 16, Manin, the last locomotive built for the Isle of Man Railway in 1926. We're now further out on the bank looking across the Snay Fell in the distance as the train climbs through the picturesque surroundings typical of this delightful island. Here we have a good view of the coaching stock, which includes some examples dating back to the last century. Even so, all were fitted with electric lighting at a time when, on the mainland, gas and oil lighting were still to be found in use. By the way, that's Manon again, easily recognisable because the shape of the cab differed from all of her sisters. Now we're nearing the top of the two-and-a-half-mile climb out of Douglas, a shot which reveals another peculiarity of the Isle of Man Railway, the practice of ballasting the track nearly to rail height, all but covering the sleepers. With such a heavy train, the banker provides invaluable rear-end assistance. 
Now we're in the woods near Crogger Pond. double-headed train puts on a fair speed. Passing under a small bridge and heading towards Sanson, number 16 is seen yet again. Castletown, originally the capital the island. With Manin on the return run to Douglas, drifting into the crossing loop to await the arrival of a southbound train. Now you can see how the cab differs from the other locomotives. Manin's driver leans out to collect the single line token from the train heading for Port Erin, and on this occasion, this is as far as we shall travel on the southern line. We now return to Douglas to follow the island's other route, the northern line to St John's, junction for the routes across to Peel on the west coast and to Ramsey in the north of the island. So at Douglas, number 12 Hutchinson runs in past the attractive signal box with a train from Port Erin. And now a view from the signal box. This, Ivor recalled, was the last train of the day to return from Port Erin and was used by very many of the day trippers returning home to Douglas. By narrow gauge standards, it was a train of immense length. The locomotive at the rear had assisted the train all the way from Port Erin. On the right, and talking to Norman Lockett, is Mr Shaw, the locomotive superintendent, whom Ivo had obviously persuaded to arrange for what he called the odd girl out to be pulled out of the shed. This is the Odd Girl Out, number 15 Caledonia, an 060 supplied by Dubs & Co of Glasgow in 1885. You'll notice she's fitted with snow plows. The railway didn't use the locomotive for any other purpose as the wheelbase was found to be too long and, as Ivor recalled, didn't do the curves a lot of good. Having been filmed and photographed, Caledonia is returned to the shed to await the next fall of snow. Again at Ivor's request, number 14 Thorn Hill is drawn out of the shed. She was built in 1880, and by this date was the only locomotive still retaining Salter valves on the dome. When you recall the general manager's hostility to photographers, it says a lot for Ivo's personality that out-of-use locomotives should have been put on display especially for his benefit. And here are the Salter valves to which I was referring. Another departure for Port Erin, and note the usual practice of leaving the cylinder cocks open. Cynics had sometimes alleged that this was at the instruction of Mr. Sherd, supposedly in an attempt to frustrate photographers, but Ivo didn't believe that particular tale. Again, it's a very heavy train, full of holidaymakers and banked at the rear for the climb up the bank and as far as Port Sodrick. Now a double header setting off at St John's, where the train will be divided, one part going down to Peel, the other over to Ramsey. 
The train pulls out, passing the large bracket signal. Number 13 Kessack, built in 1910, heads away on what at first sight appears to be double track. It was in fact two parallel single lines. The track on the left leads to Castletown and Port Erin, while Kessack is setting off towards St John's. This is Union Mills, originally the first station out of Douglas on the line to St. John's, but in fact closed to passengers when seen here. This was Ivor's favourite lineside location on the Isle of Man, a place to which he was to return many times. Another combined Peel and Ramsey train heads through the closed station. Crosby, about midway between Douglas and St. John's, was a crossing place. Here we see another combined train, which will be divided at St. John's. Judging by the smoke, it was a rather blustery day. <laughs> 